I'm Tim Vanell and I work with Mission Aviation Fellowship and we support the work with the Lesotho Flying Doctor Service and the clinics out in the mountains uh, in partnership with the government of Lesotho. Not long ago, I guess it's been almost four years ago, we found out that we were really flying caskets back out to the mountains. Patients would come in, uh, they would stay a few weeks and then before we knew it we were flying caskets back out to the mountains. This hospital happens to be the core, the center, the referral hospital of our country. We are going into the entrance of the casualty department. You are about to see many people waiting to be attended to something which we really want to change because it is our desire that anybody coming in, especially those um, genuine casualties, will be promptly attended to. And we will achieve it because we have the desire. We have one doctor to uh, 15,000, which is a very bad ratio. Many advanced countries in Europe have one to 200, one to 300. My name is Didi Muhabi. I'm one of the general surgeons in this hospital, the Queen 2 Hospital. I'm a general surgeon and I'm doing a lot of surgery which is uh, not general surgery in the, in the modern sense. I would appreciate a lot of other specialists, more doctors, general doctors to help us run the wards because at the moment in my ward for example there's myself and one other doctor who works with me and that is nowhere near enough. The economic status of this country is, is, is the biggest challenge. And the fact that we are not uh, training most of these professionals in, this, in the country. We have to strive and meet the standards of South Africa. That's the bare minimum. And also Europe and, and uh, America are, are, are attracting most of our healthcare specialists. To demonstrate that, we have in the country only one pediatrician. She's from Malawi. In the government, I'm the only pediatrician. There is a shortage of junior doctors. There is a shortage of specialists. And there is also a shortage of nursing staff. So that part of the nursing 
like uh, feeding by nasogastric tube should be done basically by nurses. But this mother has been taught how to feed by herself in the uh, nasogastric tube. So actually the mothers stay here not just uh, watching the baby but also doing part of the nursing duties like nasogastric tube feeding. That is a nurse's job, but she's doing it. We are less than 300 doctors. 90% are expatriate doctors. We have less than 2,000 nurses to look after 2.2 million people. Most of the doctors here, here, here in Lesotho are, are from outside. We, we don't have the, the Basotho doctors in most cases. So to, to talk to, the, to, to a doctor, there must be an interpreter uh -huh. in most cases. What we desperately need is, is doctors who are coming for a long-term stay and who this is their home and, and this is the, where they want to work. We really feel this need. For the first time, you realize that healthcare professionals are very are highly mobile. It, it's, uh, they can go anywhere in the world where they are offered better services and uh, salaries. Lesotho is, in a real sense, the perfect storm of the brain drain. It's a very poor country surrounded by a very rich country. The salaries that we get here, working for government, you don't really get paid a lot. So you just need to walk across the border and if you can get a job at the same level, you'd be much, much better off. But it's really important to understand that this is not just about pay scale. The doctors and nurses who I talk to here, they, they're not saying, gee, I want to be paid more. They, you know, who doesn't want to be paid more? They're not leaving only because they can't get paid. They're leaving because they can't do their work if they don't have the tools of the trade. In most areas, we find that there's no equipment to use, like you know the thermometers, the blood pressure machines. Come, I'm going to show you. You see how full this ward is. We are going to admit a patient onto that because the ward is full. And this is just supposed to be a POP room, but we have an admission in here. You can come and see. That's because the world is so full. We need to use this space. Sometimes we admit two in here. And when equipment isn't working and the electricity goes out and patients are actually dying when they don't necessarily need to die, that's something that is um, really not tolerable to people who've been trained to, to save lives. Apart from the human resources, the proximity of healthcare delivery is a challenge because their services are not close to where people live. Okay. In here we have our waiting room. Most of these people come a long way. Four hours walk, others a day's walk. All these hands you see are the patients who actually walked over four hours. Others actually wait here because they cannot all be in that room. One thing that people don't realize is is what a hard job it is to work in the district hospital. You see, when you come stay here, you leave your family behind and everybody. So you don't know how your child is doing at home. You don't know how everybody else is doing at home. You are staying here unless, until you go home again. Ah, and it is something that not, it's not, <laughs> I don't think it's acceptable really. Yeah, it's like you are staying in a, an island. The district doctor 
has to do a lot, whether it's a gunshot wounded or it's a falling off a horse and bad fractures or uh, appendicitis, they got to handle that. And that's a broader definition of family medicine uh, uh, than we, we have in the States uh, and a real challenge. Who's wrong? Who's wrong? You put all of it in. Okay. Aussie here is actually a patient who came in about two days ago. This is a TB patient who came in dehydrated, confused and everything. So what we did for her was actually she was admitted here for two days. She has been given IV fluids as you can see. And of course continued on TB treatment and given a bit of prednisone to get her going. And we're actually ready to take her home today. But we don't just take them home. Tomorrow, I'll, I'll personally go to her house and give her a home visit there. So the skills needed to, to work in a place like that are, are beyond what we're normally training doctors to do in other places. The doctors have to work in a place where referrals are not possible. The government has recognized that we have a major problem of human resource, of infrastructure and everything that goes with that. We are embarking on improving on our district health systems where the majority of the people are. And the fact that we have a nucleus of dedicated workers who continue to struggle despite the odds, I think they are a motivator for all of us. Last year, I worked in South Africa for a year after completing my medical school. Of course, like anybody else, I considered other options of going to other countries. But every time I came home, I met people who told me about the situation at home. Deep inside, I did feel guilty of the thoughts and the fact that I was working in South Africa already. And I thought I should come back home and have my contribution and see where we can take it. I can understand why people leave. I stay here because I feel, for me personally, it is the right thing to do. The more people leave, the worse it gets for the ones who are left behind because then they are fewer and fewer. So meanwhile, the problems are not getting any fewer. The patients, uh, there are more patients because of uh, many, many factors, including HIV. Clinical age did not really hit Lesotho until 2003, 2004. And that's a... Uh, and that's much later than elsewhere in Africa. The prevalence rates in the mid 80s, when they were, you know, in the 5, 10, 15 percent in Central Africa, were 0.01 percent here. Jump back 120 years to Cecil Rhodes, the mines, mining camps, black South Africans moved into enclaves, economically non viable, uh, had had to pay a hut tax. The only way you could pay the hut tax was work in the mines. The mines are surrounded by women. Here you have a lifestyle for 130 years of that. Not a lot of ways to earn money in Lesotho. Lesotho, really hard workers, go down to the mines. And HIV positive people uh, came in hordes into the mines. Then you had this epidemiologic pump in the mines. And then it came to Lesotho. HIV AIDS is the biggest, biggest threat to the life of this country. And with 40% of the people between 30 and 39, men and women, positive, you have a lot of people dying, including health professionals, teachers, doctors, nurses. And that leads to a crisis. <laughs> Pilamutsinotting, <laughs> Hello, 
me re qeteletse le le re ikametse ka pele ho bana re bona ba ga mohetse in this current climate with the epidemic of um, hiv aids anywhere reported from 23% to 31% you can you can realize that it is really a daunting responsibility but it's not a simple it's not a simple problem it's not just that people with hiv are dying of tuberculosis and that's what mostly kills them here in Lesotho is tuberculosis but they can also spread that to their hiv negative neighbors family members healthcare workers so Lesotho is has to face these epidemics and i think i think they're really that's why we're here because they're serious about it they want they want they want to take this on We are currently as of now working on an emergency human resource plan because we have reached crisis level. Partners in Health came to Lesotho to address the current needs in Lesotho, which is basically to provide health care for the poor, especially up here in the mountains, in the remote areas where people don't uh, have access to health care especially now with the main problems two main problems that we have the HIV problem plus the TB problem it's a difficult thing to do it's sim simple to say well we're here to provide integrated modern healthcare services to poor people most of whom have never had them before but it's very complicated in the doing and one of the reasons it's complicated is there's no electricity uh, that you know there's the clinics uh, that are up there are they don't, they don't have staff we can be able to follow patients up. You see, sometimes you see patients at the health center, and after the, t the time you expect the patient to come to the health center again for a revisit or a checkup, the patient is not there. We don't have a way of following the patient up. The patient is dead or is just not coming for the, you don't know. So because of a few people we are having, we can, nobody will go out to the village to see a patient, while the actual thing would be for a follow-up to see the situation the patient is living in. So if we are short staffed, how can we do that? We are not doing the ideal work, we are just doing the work, but not the ideal work we should be doing. The part of this story that's been missed most by those who study it, the community health workers. A community health worker lives in a community and serves his or her neighbors. So huge problem with doctors, huge problem with nurses, but we can get community health workers trained and trained well and, and have them improve the quality of, of the care here. It was just a year ago in July that there were no no patients at any of these clinics on AIDS care. And at Nohana, the place that I flew to today, they've got nearing 400 people on full-blown antiretroviral drugs in just a year. The goal is sustainability and to assist the people to be able to take care of themselves in a dignified way. <laughs>
The biggest concern with the antiretroviral drugs, the, a very complicated regimen of medicine every day for an entire life. You don't have a break from it. There's no, you know, so you have to have people who can follow up. And what's been really cool is to see the families and the villagers and everything kind of get around the people that are sick uh, and work together. Not only are you taking, taking on the healthcare crisis, you're taking on the personnel crisis by saving lives and bringing people into the work. What gives me the most hope for this country is that people in this country are not afraid to deal with this epidemic. We are prepared to face it, test, and make sure that every person is going to get the care and treatment that they deserve. <laughs> The government of Lesotho has increased access to health care to as many people as possible by dropping the price to 10 malut, roughly one US dollar. And for that, you get consultation, drugs, investigations, you can even see a specialist. We are given TB drugs for free. We are given antiretroviral drugs for free to pass on to the public. Our teacher told us that HIV is uncurable disease. We should still stress a lot on, on prevention because if we, we do not stop the, the flow of water, it will keep on flowing. So we have to stop the, where the water is coming from, we have to stop the cause of AIDS so that we take care of those that are infected and affected and to show that it is we are, we are having few new cases. Here at this clinic we take care of children with HIV. Kids come in, they get tested, if they're positive they get enrolled in care at our center. We continue to follow them and give them all of their primary pediatric care as well as their HIV care and their medicines. So our nurses are in the midst of a course learning about care and treatment of kids with HIV. Most of our, our programs are, are nurse-driven initiatives, whether it is HIV AIDS care and treatment, whether it's TB initiative. Apart from surgical initiatives, really, everything else is a nurse-driven initiative. We have reached the stage where we are saying, for non-complicated cases, nurses can initiate ARV therapy. This is usually reserved for doctors, but we are we are saying our nurses we have adequately trained can do it. And that's how we have been able to improve on access. This is really a nurse-based system, and you need those three pillars, community health workers, nurses, and docs working in a team together. And the docs and nurses need management skills and public health skills as well as clinical skills. There's clearly a huge human resources problem in health care in Lesotho. Uh, there are a couple million people who live here. There's zero medical schools. People who are trained abroad uh, don't have the incentives that they need to return. Our program is designed um, to, uh, to address both the hospital situation and the human resource situation. At the same time, to 
begin a training program that will give the doctors the knowledge and the skills and the attitudes necessary to work uh, in a place like this. There currently is not now or ever has there been any kind of uh, specialty training program in the country of Lesotho. The Laboha project will be the first um, residency specialty training program. It's geared towards training doctors to have the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to be excellent district doctors. We are hoping that by aligning with a well-known university like Boston University, it will make our people understand because, by the way, education is a major priority in, in this country. We feel our, our residents will see this as, as an opportunity of actually coming back home because they will value being part of this program. We've identified about 65 students uh, who are in medical schools, uh, mostly in South Africa, but around the world. Uh, and we're working hard to contact them, uh, to talk to them about the program. My name is Pokan Nedlodlo. I'm from Maseru, Kwading, and I'm studying in the University of Free State in Bloemfontein, and that is my fourth year in medicine. When we had a meeting with the physicians at home. They told us, I mean, you guys, we really depend on you now. So, I mean, it's upon us now to see that we make it better. What we found is that the, many of them would like to come back home uh, if some of these issues uh, were addressed. That is that the salaries isn't everything, uh, but the salary has to be, some, has to be somewhere between what, where Lesotho is now and where South Africa is. But they also tell us that the hospitals need to function better. And if everything else is equal, and not even equal, if things are just close, a lot of the students have said they want to be home with their families in their own country to help their own people. I have a family here, so if I can be able to put a plate in front of them every day, I'll definitely come back home. <laughs> <I'm here. laughs> we probably will never compete with our neighbor or the countries that are attracting them, but we believe that talking to them would be able to attract a lot more who would be willing to stay, provided they can be meet their own basic human needs and their families. Just one doctor, one nurse for a few thousand people. You get everything set up and put people on therapy and you see these people who look like skeletons when they come in, you don't recognize them just two or three months later. <coughs> We've got a huge crisis on our hands. Last time we were scrambling to get out before the weather and I said something about, yeah, I feel like we're in the Navy trying to get off the boat before the storm comes. And he said, you know, we're right. We're in a race and we're in a war and it's all we can to fight that war and to win the race. There is hope in this place. There is a desire. We do have a zest and a zeal, despite whatever shortcomings we may have had in the past, but we are willing as a nation and as a health system to pull up our socks and to attend to the people, be it sick or be people who are well, given that the best kind of health system is that which does not only cater for the sick, but even to prevent, to cater for the well-being spiritually, psychologically, socially, and all otherwise. If people in Lesotho cannot be taken care of by their own people, it's an embarrassment. So I know, I'm sure they're going to rise to the occasion. It takes time to change, but I think we have, at the moment, the right people uh, who are engaged in changing. People define success differently, I know that. Other people define success based on the amount of money they have in the bank. But if we go back and go to our African way of thinking, remember what importance in the community is all about. The contribution that you can have to your community, that's what we use to gauge success. And I think, and I still want to believe, in the true African sense of the word success, which is the contribution that I can have from the community. I think that's a reason that's keeping me here. And I hope there will be someone out there who shares the same values as me and 
we were friendly. Watch this and come back.